Silent Slips um, is a name that occurred to me pre the moment we're in now of the pandemic, um, COVID-19. And it was connecting for me with the idea then of ritual, the relevance of ritual for all of us in terms of gatherings of people, marking time, marking key events in our lives, etc. Um, and the history of that kind of activity in terms of um, a theological or, or, or a kind of religious context. Um, but of course now it perhaps that phrase takes on a slightly different meaning um, in that the term silent slips also refers to um, the almost silent, you know, imperceptible movements, earth movements of tectonic plates shifting prior to major earthquakes. Um, so the kind of sense of prescience and, and anticipation um, seems, you know, of the moment. So my idea for this exhibition um, pertaining to ritual is more specifically the kind of meanings that ritualistic gatherings might have for us now, um, but the kinds of meanings that ritualistic gatherings might have for us through social media. Um, through the way we receive, we're all bombarded in, in, a, in the idea of an urban city life, we're bombarded with so much news and information constantly. And um, to the point where we don't know which source of information to trust. And, and the idea of fake news is in circulation and so on and so forth. So, you know, how do we kind of react or take a step back from that? Um, and the historic idea of um, communities and societies trying to put a face to unknown events, you know, mysterious shifts in the landscape of, of their existence, um, other powers um, that may be, and, and the inclination to personify, you know, humanly personify those unknown things, those mysterious forces, is, is the kind of story of superstition and a lot of early religious thinking, you know, and so how, how, can, I, how can we play on those ideas, link them together, um, and as I say, specifically at this moment with the, the idea of silent slips. These are the challenges for me um, and the things that interest me in the work I'm making, but also that of the other artists in the show. John Stark's paintings um, speak to me in a similar way on, on those two levels. So both the backward looking historical um, influence in, in antiquity, um, in Renaissance history painting and so forth, but also um, commentating somehow on popular culture and on this late capitalist post postmodern period, um, if if you like, for want of a better phrase, and I think he, you know, those influences are um, coexist in his paintings, um, and you can see very easily. And if if I talk about his work in two broad categories, there's five paintings included in this exhibition, um, but the the painting Coven. Uh, which features um, a group of women in the landscape, a very, very blackened out, dark landscape, reflective of a psychological interior space, perhaps, um, is um, laid out like a, in, the, in the manner of um, a narrative history painting. Um, and, and that typifies one aspect of John's output, um, and certainly in this show, and then there are a series of smaller pieces that present sort of... Um, Again, in a different way, a metaphor for an interior psychological state. But um, these alcove paintings in a, a small stage set uh, where symbolic items that are set up in, um, with a light and shade of a still life painting, essentially, commentate or refer to this kind of symbolism. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, that, that, that broadly introduces the work that he has in this exhibition. Um, John's a very, very highly skilled painter, and so he's working in um, a kind of, you know, he's an inheritor of surrealist traditions, um, and he's a, very, a consummate realist painter in his own right. And he's using those um, skills to craft images that are beguiling, mysterious, complex, um, alluring, poetic, poetic on a... a a kind of personal level, you know, that space that exists between the viewer and the surface of the painting, the work, and the illusionistic space, the window that's presented of a, a space beyond. And I think John um, is unusually articulate with those languages. So I'm Derek Harris, 
um, let me tell you a little bit about my paintings too. Um, I became very interested in a series of antiquarian photographs and later a YouTube video documenting some early contemporary dance. Um, contemporary dance images that were for the time quite groundbreaking. A uh, French choreographer called Maurice Béjart. Um, that in itself is, is historical note, but what interested me about his work was the, aside from the ethnic influences that he's melded and welded into a classical ballet structure, was uh, a series of the, the presentation of a series of players cavorting around a, a sort of ubiquitous stage, and how that can become a metaphor for an internal psychological space when transcribed into a painting. The figures in my paintings are striking, very they're articulated in very unusual ways, bodily, anatomical articulations, and that for me is a form of expression. Um, if we consider the figures to be themselves to be ciphers um, or players in an unnamed drama, the poses or the images, the shapes which their bodies adopt become part of that metaphorical state um, and that's how I think of them. In the paintings that I make I use source material which is photographic. Uh, the photographic material comes from captured YouTube videos um, and I take stills sometimes photographing the computer screen which has a reflective surface so some of the space that I'm occupying as I take the photographs ends up being reflected in the imagery, in the document, the photograph, and then I choose to transcribe that into the painting as I make it, as I construct the image. Um, so that's in, an important set of references for, for me to have the now acknowledged through this chain of mediated imagery as well as the then. Fiona Finnegan's work um, is quite small paintings on the whole. She works on quite a intimate scale um, and she's interested in the, the transitional light in a day, so the morning and the afternoon and as darkness changes to light and vice versa, um, the evening. Um, so, so this is, is um, a kind of parallel interest to the polarities I was talking about with John and the general theme of the show. Um, but a painting that comes to mind in the exhibition by Fiona, um, Emile's Dream, um, which features a silhouetted female figure um, atop a, a hill, a landscape, against a sunset, an orange bursting sunset, is um, an image at once of a kind of figure communing or beseeching or connecting with the landscape. And, it, and it's, um, the way in which it's painted and the kind of matted surface of the, of the painting itself, um, the impure nature of that surface, which sometimes has bits of grit or cobweb, etc., in it, um, kind of uh, pulls us into a, a poetic space in terms of what we're beholding as a viewer. Um, and I think that that's, uh, that's a powerful form of poetry working in, in that painting. By Dawn's Early Light is another painting by Fiona in the exhibition. Uh, and it presents unfurling plants sort of uh, responding to the crisp, cool light of a new day and uh, a kind of sense of um, a sort of celebratory, mysterious light being the real subject matter. Uh, and again, the surface of the painting and the way in which it's painted, the imperfections in the surface of the painting, um, play with that which is represented um, and engender uh, a poetic space for the viewer to enter. And, and of course, unfortunately, this exhibition can't be seen firsthand, um, but that is where the most interesting experience lies in that encounter. Ben Edge would like to tell you about his own paintings, um, and uh, here's a little video with him unpacking the symbolism of his work. What I have here is a series of paintings that I've made just over the last year called Moon Law. And in these paintings, I explore the seasonal customs and the different folklore behind each month's full moon. Okay, so we are now at the merry month of May. 
and we have what was once known as the full flower moon. And as you all know, at the beginning of May, we have the coming of summer and we have nationwide celebrations marking this time where the land is most fertile and the flowers are all coming out and the land's literally at its most bright and colourful. So we have a tradition that harks right back, you know, to times people, some people believed all the way back to times of nature worship, where, you know, there was carefully arranged garlands that were used in parts of sacrifices. Some even say ritual sacrifices, where, you know, sacrifices were made to appease uh, the gods and to kind of celebrate the coming of summer and now the, the bountiful time where living's a lot easier than the tough months of winter. So here we have one of my favourite traditions, which is the Castleton Garland Day, which you may have seen other paintings that I made. And this is where, you know, in Derbyshire, there's actually a strong tradition of garland making. It's actually the strongest in the country. So here is a beautiful arrangement of flowers made by locals. And it is then put on a man who rides through the town on horseback. There's all sorts of reasons people believe this takes place, but it connects to this idea of the budding land, coming of summer and a celebration of all these things coming together. The last thing we have in this painting is the blue moon. So last year when this painting was made, it was a blue moon and blue moons aren't actually blue. What they are is you usually have three full moons per season, but some seasons you have four full moons and the fourth is known as a blue moon. And these happen once in a blue moon, hence the expression. The next one will be in 2021.